Man, wasn't that awesome? What a great time worshiping the Lord together. I love looking around the room and seeing the smiles on faces while we're singing that song. And it's just really cool how worshiping the Lord has the power to change your entire perspective on your life and your reality. Well, I want to welcome you to church tonight. It's good to be with you. Those of you who are at our Mesa campus and those who are joining us online. We've had a great time of services today around the city. And hey, four o'clock service, I want to put it on your radar that in the mornings, Uh, services today, I encourage those who make this their church home to shift to the PM service time slot, like a lot of you, you guys who really love Jesus, you hardcore Generation Church members. You know, it's not a guilt trip. It just shows who's really committed, you know? And so I say, hey, if you can move to the PMs, that helps us make room in the morning uh, slots where more likely guests will come to those times. Uh, So we wanna make room for them and we're starting to run out of space again in the morning as school has started and people get back in the routine. So if you come to one of the PM services like this one, thank you, you're making a difference and you can help me by texting or talking to your friends who go to Generation Church and, you know, inviting them to the PMs with you. I can't really guilt trip them as their pastor, but you can as their friend. So it's for a good cause. Thank you for your help with that. It's awesome. We are looking forward to our new worship space being completed. We are aiming for November for that to be opening. And yeah, it's going to be exciting. So keep uh, the church uh, in prayer as we are finishing that project up. We're in a series in the book of Exodus. It's the second book in your Bible, if you want to turn there. Um, We're in chapter 4 this evening, and I want to title this message, Give Me a Sign. Lord, give me a sign. I'm not going to rap that DMX song. Uh, Have you ever wanted a sign? Have you ever asked God for a sign? I have. Like when I was called into ministry and I was moving back to Arizona... In that process, I was a single guy, and I wanted a wife. Um, Some people have the gift of singleness. I do not have that gift. I wanted a wife. And so I was praying, okay, Lord, I need a wife. Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? And me and Amy had been friends since we were younger, and we even dated a little bit after high school for a few months. I was the first guy she ever kissed. Obviously, I made a pretty big impression. (laughs) So I was moving back to Arizona. We had been friends all along. I knew her really well. Um, Our parents went to Bible college together. And so on paper, Amy checked every box. She was godly. She was called into ministry. She was sweet. She was kind. But I was like, okay, Lord, I need to know if Amy is the one I'm supposed to marry. And I'm praying about this. We hadn't even started dating yet. We hadn't even really been flirting. But I was praying. And I was praying, God, give me a sign. Give me a sign because I want to know. I don't want to waste her time or hurt her feelings or get caught up in something that's not from you. So give me a sign. And I had been leading this young adult Bible study at the time. And one night Amy came to visit the Bible study. And here I had been praying for a sign. Amy walks in and she just looks so pretty. It was like everything went into slow motion. And her hair is like flowing in the wind. And I was like. That'll do. That's my sign right there. Okay, here we go. I'm a simple man. So here we are 10 years later being married. It's been good. It's been good. Love my wife. So Exodus chapter 4, we're going to talk about signs a lot tonight. In verse 1, Moses protested again. He's been having this argument with God who called him in chapter 3 to go and deliver the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt as his messenger, and Moses is struggling, and he's got fear, and he's got hesitations, and so God's talking to him still, and Moses protests, what if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw down the staff, and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. Then they will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with a severe skin disease. 
Now put your hand back into your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back in, and when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, if they do not believe you and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, they will be convinced by the second sign. And if they don't believe you or listen to you even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it out on the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile will turn to blood on the ground. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. God is sending Moses to deliver this message to Pharaoh, let my people go. And to the Hebrew people, God has sent me, it's time for your deliverance. And you got to understand this is a pretty big deal. It's been 400 years of slavery for the Hebrew people. They've been praying for deliverance and they have received no divine revelation from God for generation after generation. And so now here's this guy, Moses, who's going to show up. And imagine if all you've ever known is slavery, And all your family has ever known is slavery. And this guy shows up you never even met before. His name's Mo. Hey, guys, my name's Moses. I I haven't really been around the last 40 years. I've been a shepherd in Midian. Uh, Here's the thing. Um, I was out taking care of my sheep one day, and I saw this bush that was on fire. But it wasn't on fire, but it was. And so I went to check it out, and I'm like, what is up with this bush that's on fire, but it's not burning up? And then God spoke to me, and he was like, Moses, Moses. And so I walked over, and he's like, go and send my people this message and I'm like I don't know and so here I am guys and God wanted me to tell you pack up your stuff because we're leaving this place how many of you know I'm not going with that guy bro it sounds like you fell and hit your head I don't really think you came with a message from God and so Moses is asking God like how how are they going to believe me why would they believe me and that's a pretty good question honestly That's a good question because not everyone who says they have a word from the Lord actually got a word from the Lord. Not everyone who claims to have a word of prophecy actually got it from God. Not every strange dream comes from God. People will message me uh, sometimes, Pastor Ryan, I had this dream uh, and and this happened and this happened. What do you think it means? And I'll be like, bro, I think it means you need to stop eating so late before you go to bed. (laughs) Not every strange dream is from God. So Moses knew people are going to be skeptical, and they need some proof. And so God gave Moses some signs to show the Hebrew people that Moses was really sent with a legit message from God. He told him, you know, you can take some water and pour it out on the ground, and I will turn it into blood. And the water from the Nile River was very significant. The Nile River was the source of life in this region. It was a source of water and food and all the trade came through the Nile. And so the Nile represented life, but God turns the water into blood, which represents death. He has the power of life and death. God told Moses, put your hand inside your cloak. And he took it out and it was white with a skin disease. Uh, We think it's probably some kind of leprosy. And in those days, people were terrified of leprosy. It was a very contagious disease, so if you got leprosy, they would send you out from the community and isolate you. People were very scared of catching leprosy, and so God was showing, I have the power of cursing, and I have the power of healing, even over sickness and disease. And then I love God said, what's that in your hand? And Moses had his staff. He said, a staff. And God said, okay, throw it down on the ground. So Moses did it, and it turned into a snake. And Moses jumped back. He was scared, which I would have been scared too. And then God says, take it by the tail. I don't know about you, but that's where my faith would have really been tested. Like, I don't want to touch some snake. That's crazy. But he he overcame his fear and faith caused him to reach down and grab it by the tail. It turned back into a staff. And it represented God's power to transform, God's power over nature. God made a man out of dust, so it's not surprising that he could make a snake out of a stick. And it shows you that when God calls you to do something really big, he doesn't ask you to become someone that you're not. In fact, he'll often use what you already have in your hand, but he'll just ask you to trust him with it. And it goes on to say in chapter 4, verse 20, that when Moses went back to the land of Egypt, Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And this is the same staff he stretched out over the Red Sea, and God parted the water. And I read about the staff of God. And I don't know about you, I grew up uh, as a kid in the 90s watching Saturday morning uh, superhero cartoons. Anybody else besides me? 
Okay, thanks for leaving me alone up here. <laughs> Feeling like a giant dork. But as, you know, my inner, my inner like, child who watched Spider-Man and all these cartoons growing up, I'm like, the staff of God. That sounds so cool. I wish I had the staff of God. I don't need to part any ocean, but I would love to part traffic on, on my drive and I just, cars, right? Like, ha ha, the staff of God. Like, it'd be awesome, right? God does have the power to do amazing miracles. And God does some of his most epic miracles in the book of Exodus. And we're going to talk about them over the following weeks and months. And many of you have experienced miracles too. You've seen signs, you've seen wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is awesome. But as cool as signs and wonders are, I want you to understand today that a sign is just a symbol. A sign is just a symbol. Maybe you have flown into Sky Harbor Airport at one point and you've seen the giant Phoenix sign on the side of the Usury Pass mountain range. Maybe you wondered, you know, what's that about? Well, this was constructed in 1949 by a World War II pilot named Charlie Merritt who was an air explorer scout leader. And it took five years to build this giant sign. They even had to use dynamite to blast in the side of the mountain. It took 430 gallons of white paint. The letters there are 100 feet tall, and the sign stretches out 1,000 feet long, which would be like if the Eiffel Tower was laid on its side. Uh, this, this sign right here, it is three times longer than the famous Hollywood sign in L.A., and that just goes to show you that everything is better in Arizona. <laughs> California might have the ocean, but we have freedom. <laughs> but as cool as that sign is, and as massive as it is, it is just a symbol of something far greater. You wouldn't go and visit this sign and then tell your friends that you live in Phoenix. Observing this sign is not the same as seeing the city. This sign is really cool, but it represents almost 5 million people in the 10th largest city in the United States. It's just a sign, and a sign is just a symbol. Or then I think about this. Maybe you've seen some of these driving around town before. Maybe you've seen something like this. We've got a, a volunteer team that will go out and put these uh, out around the local intersections on, on A-frames and... I always think about how people probably drive by these on their way home from work or on the weekend after they just had a fight with their spouse. And maybe they just drove past one of you and they saw one of those Generation Church decals on your car. Yeah. I know a lot of you have those decals on your car. You just like want to represent your church because you love your church. And some of you are like, I don't want one of those decals because I'm a terrible driver. And <laughs> I don't want to represent God that way. But I, I think it's actually better if you're a terrible driver, because it just shows people how much grace God has for sinners like you. So you can represent too. Represent the love and mercy of Jesus. But then imagine, like, imagine they drive by you on the way to work and like, oh, Generation Church sticker. Like that guy loves his church enough to put a sticker on his car. What kind of weirdo? What kind of church? And then on the way home, they see one of these. And they probably think, hmm, maybe this is a sign. And it is. <laughs> it is a sign. God's telling you, you need to go to church. You need Jesus in your life. But it'd be funny if I took this home and told everybody, I got a new church. Come on over. Come on over and um, see my church. Here it is. Isn't it great? I love my church. It never hurts my feelings. It's always there for me. I can do it exactly the way I like it. We sing the songs I want to sing every time. Just me and my church. But see, the thing is, you know, this is just a sign. This isn't the church. It represents the church. This doesn't love me. This represents a community that loves me. This isn't the destination. It points the way to the church that I love. It's a sign and a sign is just a symbol. And so we don't want to get so caught up chasing after signs that we miss who they point to. Right? I don't want to get so consumed 
chasing after miracles that I miss the Messiah. We thank God for signs and wonders, but we have to be careful not to get more excited about a sign than who the sign points to. Because we don't worship a symbol, we worship a savior. And I want to talk about that more. In Matthew 12, with Jesus, it says, One day some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied, only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So the Pharisees come, they demand a sign. We we want a sign. You need to prove Your authority, prove what you're saying is true. And Jesus basically says, you're evil and adulterous. Jesus just had a way of saying it, you know? Now consider that when they demanded a sign, Jesus had already healed the sick. He'd restored sight to the blind. He had cast demons out of demon-possessed people. He calmed a storm with his voice. So he'd already done a a lot. But here they are again. We, We want another sign. And Jesus could have done something on demand. He had the power. He could have pulled a rabbit out of his robe. But instead, he's like, no, I'm not doing that. I don't perform on demand. The only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. And if you're familiar with the story of Jonah, you know Jonah, he ran from God. He was thrown overboard in the middle of a storm. He was swallowed by a giant fish. God preserved him in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights, and then the fish spit him out on the shore, and he went back to his assignment and preached the message of the Lord because he learned his lesson the hard way. And Jesus said, that's the sign I'm going to give you, the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he was saying the way that Jonah went into the belly of a fish for three days, I'm going to be killed and buried in a tomb for three days. And then I'm going to be resurrected again by the power of God. And that will prove my authority. Because see, there had been prophets and men of God who performed signs by God's power throughout history, but no one had ever died, been buried, and been raised to life again after three days by the power of God, uh, the way that Jesus would be. And so that would prove his authority in a way that Other signs never really could, and it proved when he did it that his message was true. He really was the son of God. He is the savior of the world. He's the only way to be forgiven from sin. He's the only way to escape the fires of hell that burn for eternity and find eternal life with Jesus, inheriting God's favor in in heaven. So the resurrection is the greatest sign in history. You want to get this clear in your mind. As cool as it is that God turned a staff into a snake, it's a much bigger deal that Jesus turned sinners into sons. As cool as it is that God parted the water of the Red Sea, it's a much bigger deal that God pardons you from your sins. The rescue of the Hebrews from slavery changed history, but the resurrection changes all of our eternity. So we don't want to get so caught up thinking that little signs and wonders, which are cool, are the big show, when in reality, the main show happened 2,000 years ago, when Jesus came out of the tomb. And as big of a deal as that is, even though Jesus rose again, he appeared to people over a period of 40 days, and even 500 people at one time, many people still did not believe in him. Even defeating death was not enough to convince unbelievers. There are doubters who say about the resurrected Jesus, well, I wasn't there. I won't believe it unless I see it with my own eyes. Even one of Jesus' own disciples said that when he heard the news that Jesus had risen. I won't believe it until I see it, until I touch him myself. His name was Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. You're going to probably meet him in heaven someday. (laughs) Doubting Thomas! He'll say, please, it's just Thomas now. But there are 10 extra biblical ancient sources that mention the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, not even in the Bible, written by non-Christians like Jews and Roman historians. And it talks about Jesus and this new movement that believed he rose from the dead. And so there is 
undeniable evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, I think it takes more faith not to believe than to believe. And that there are a lot of people, they remain hard-hearted. I love this quote from the book, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. It says, even the highly critical New Testament scholar, Rudolf Baltman, agreed that historical criticism can establish the fact that the first disciples came to believe in the resurrection and that they thought they had seen the risen Jesus. Atheistic New Testament scholar Gerd Ludman concludes, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Paula Fredrickson of Boston University comments, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historical evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw. But I do know that as a historian that they must have seen something. So these are non-believers, scholars, and doubters who say, we, we don't really believe, but we can't deny that these guys thought they saw something. I, I've shared Jesus with people before and tried to tell them the good news, and they didn't really believe, and they seemed skeptical, and I found myself praying like, well, God, show them a sign. Give them a sign. Give them a dream. But in reality, if they're determined to remain hard-hearted, even a sign wouldn't convince them. Just like people who saw Jesus resurrected, they still weren't convinced. And sometimes you wonder maybe like, well, why doesn't God do more miracles? If he just did more miracles, more people would believe. That's not necessarily true. Because God, Jesus could show up right now and he could heal someone or raise someone from the dead. And you could have it on video and there'd still be people who say, oh, that's probably not true. It's probably just fake. It's probably CGI. I, don't, I wouldn't believe it. And even if they saw it with their own eyes, they wouldn't even trust their own eyes. But you have to believe in your heart that Jesus is God raised and coming again, despite whatever miracles and signs you might see. Now, here's the cool thing. God did not stop doing miracles, signs, and wonders after the resurrection. God still does miracles, signs, and wonders in the New Testament church era, which we're still in today. In Acts 14, it says, But the apostles stayed there a long time, preaching boldly about the grace of the Lord. And the Lord proved their message was true by giving them the power to do miraculous signs and wonders. So again, the miracles they performed were not meant to be amazing by themselves, but to prove that their amazing message was true. And I want you to realize that God is still in the power-proving, wonder-working, sign-showing business today. Today, God is still healing, he's still providing, he's still transforming, and he's still restoring. There is no scripture in this Bible that implies God stopped doing miracles. I don't know what kind of denominational background you came from or what your religious background is, but there are some people who are raised Christian and they get this message that, well, God doesn't really do miracles anymore. That was just in Bible times and that was just for the apostles. And we don't need that anymore because we have the Bible now. That's not what the Bible says. And the Holy Trinity isn't Father, Son, and Holy Bible. The third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. And he's still active and moving today. God's power to perform miracles, it wasn't power possessed by the apostles. It was the power that belonged to the Holy Spirit working through the apostles. And the same Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, which means the potential for miracles is in the room. Wherever you go, wherever you are, you know that God is with you and he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the same power that raised Christ from the grave is in you. So the potential for signs and wonders is always there. I do think one reason why we don't see more miracles is because sometimes we lack the faith to ask. We lack the faith to ask and believe. In Matthew 13, remember that Jesus talks about how he couldn't, the Bible talks about how Jesus couldn't do any miracles in his hometown because the people there, they didn't believe in him. They, they didn't honor him. And so scripture says a prophet is without honor in his hometown. It, it wasn't that Jesus didn't have power in his hometown, but nobody in that town recognized his power. They didn't have enough faith to bring him their problems. 
And so he couldn't heal them because they never gave him the opportunity. You have to have enough faith to ask. You have to have enough faith to believe. And at the same time, listen to me on this, there is bad theology, there is bad teaching that if you don't get a miracle, it's because you didn't have enough faith. That's bad teaching. Are y'all tracking on that? I want to make it kindergarten clear. That's bad theology. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you only need faith the size of a mustard seed. Just a little bit of faith. Just a tiny little bit. Just a little, just a little dribble of faith. You just need enough to ask in the first place. And, and just recognize God's power that he is able to do anything. You might even still have doubt as you ask and say, I believe, but help my unbelief. And there's a lot of Christians, they don't, they don't really think to ask because they don't believe. Maybe you have asked God to heal you or to do a, a miracle in your life and it didn't happen. And so you lost faith in God's power to do miracles and you just stopped asking. Or maybe you thought, well, I think it's safer if I just don't get my hopes up anymore. So I, I, I just won't ask. There are some people, they believe in God's power, but as if it's just an ancient power from Bible times and not a right now power, but it is. It is a power that's available to us, that's still working right now, because God is the same. And that's a theme of this series. God is the same, and the same God lives in you, and he still has power, and there's nothing that says he stopped working by his power. And we also, listen, we don't want to make the mistake of thinking that more miracles would solve all of our problems. Sometimes Christians find themselves praying for miraculous intervention, and really what they need to do is obey the commands that God has already given them. You're not going to like this part of the sermon. <laughs> there will be people like, God, I need you to do a financial miracle in my life. Could you just you know, make dollars rain from the sky? I'm going I'm to go check in my mailbox. Is there a check? Nope. Is there a check? Nope, nope. And, and you're like, man, I, I need God to do a miracle. I need God to provide. And God's saying, really what you need is to stop spending more money than you make. No, I need, I need you to provide supernaturally, God. And God's saying, no, you need self-control, discipline, and a budget. Or, or sometimes people will be like, oh, I don't really feel good. I need God to heal me. And sometimes you get sick. It's beyond your control. You can't help it. But sometimes it's, you know, God, I don't, I don't really feel good. Will you heal me? And God's saying, let's try this. Maybe stop eating a pint of ice cream every night to drown your sorrows. And then let's see if you feel better. I know this isn't the part of your, the sermon you're going to post about. You know, you don't, you don't like this part. See, God loves you too much to miraculously save you from all the consequences of making bad choices. And sometimes his fatherly love requires letting us learn the hard way so we'll start living his way. And at the same time, his grace is amazing. And he treats us better than we deserve. And so sometimes he'll do miracles in our lives because he loves us. And sometimes he'll heal us and take disease away just to show his kindness. And sometimes he'll provide for our needs just to just show us how generous he is. He'll open the right door at the right time and show you favor you don't deserve just because he's good. He'll move mountains in your life just to show he can. So he's better than we think he is. He loves us more than we hope he will. He's good to us. And as cool as it is when he does that, we still don't want to get caught up chasing after signs more than the one they point to. Because misdirected emphasis on miracles, signs, and wonders leads to danger. In Matthew 24, we get this warning from Jesus. He says, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive. If possible, even God's chosen ones. That's you. Talking about Christians. And Jesus says, I have warned you about this ahead of time. So he's expecting you not to fall for it. Okay, church? Okay? Listen, I love you. I want to make this very clear. The devil is a supernatural being who has power to work on this earth. His power is nothing compared to God's power. Let's make that clear. 
Sometimes people get confused about that and they make it out like, you know, Jesus versus the devil is Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. And, you know, it's really close. And yet we believe Jesus will win in the end. That's not at all what reality is. Like, Jesus is God. He has existed eternally. The devil is a created being. God has all power over the forces of darkness. God temporarily allows the devil to roam the earth like a lion looking for those he may devour. And he gives mankind free will and the opportunity to choose. The devil and his demons have a degree of power. And so the devil and dark forces can perform signs and wonders. And they do that at times in order to deceive. So you have to watch out for deception. There's a warning here. Watch out. Let me talk about deception. Deception happens in degrees. Some deception is more obvious and some is more subtle. Some is obvious like satanic worship or the occult or witchcraft. People get into that stuff in the pursuit of power. If you ask someone who gets caught up in Satanism, like, why did you do that? Usually it comes down to this, they wanted some type of power and there might actually be attainable power that comes from the devil, but it comes at a great cost. It is possible for the devil to do signs and wonders, to heal possibly, to give someone knowledge they wouldn't have, to show some kind of power over the natural world and so whenever you see a miraculous sign, you have to ask, what or who is the source of this sign? Where did the power to perform this miracle come from? Are the miracle workers preaching Christ crucified and risen again, or are they drawing people into the schemes of hell? Yeah. The devil will gladly offer someone power and prestige if that's what it takes to keep that person separated from God for eternity. I think about, you know, you see magicians like David Blaine levitating or freezing himself in a block of ice. And, and I don't really know, like, is this a magic trick or, or does this guy actually have some kind of power? And if he does, where did it come from? And, and if he has power that came from someplace other than God, it might have gotten him temporary fame in this life. But at what cost? That's why in Mark 8, it says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Now, most Christians would not get involved accidentally with witchcraft. I, I, I haven't gotten that a lot, where it's like, Pastor Ryan, I got caught up in Satanism. <laughs> that, that, that's not a common problem, but I have seen ignorant, uninformed people be deceived by more subtle deceptions. Let's give the devil some credit. He is a clever liar. And he has been deceiving for thousands of years, so he knows what works and what doesn't work. And he doesn't usually outright contradict God because that's too obvious. He usually just subtly twists the truth. And he says, did God really say? Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? No, that's not what God said at all in the first place. But he just subtly twists the truth. Because if he can just bump you off course one or two degrees, eventually you'll end up miles away from the truth. So he twists the truth. And I, I can tell you this, the devil loves how Hollywood portrays him as a scary, horrifying, gross creature with horns and a pitchfork and a tail because that's not really how he tends to appear because he's too smart for that, to be honest. Listen to this passage. Read it carefully. It says in 2 Corinthians 11, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach, look, a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or look, a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. But I am not surprised, look, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they'll get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. So I just described to you exactly how Mormonism came to be. Joseph Smith said that in 1823, he was out in the woods and apparently he was praying, he says, and an angel of light appeared to him. Okay, may maybe an angel appeared to him. Angels have appeared to people. Only problem is the angel gave him 
a different gospel than the gospel we've had for almost 2,000 years at that point. And in that gospel, they have a different Jesus. I've talked to Mormons and they're like, well, we believe in Jesus. I'm like, yeah, you say you believe in Jesus, but he's a different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible. What do you mean? The Jesus of Mormonism was a created being and the brother of Lucifer. The Jesus of the Bible is God and has existed eternally. These are different Jesuses. You use the same name, but we're talking about different things. And, and people don't recognize it because they don't know what's in the word of God. And so they are deceived by a false apostle. And you even get people knocking on your door. Hi, I'm Elder Smith. And they're really nice. And they're really well behaved. It, it's like just what it says. Servants of righteousness they appear as. I can't even believe it. We live in Arizona. It's like God nailed it. It's false religion. And we were warned, we were warned. But people don't catch it because they don't understand that what they're hearing actually contradicts the Bible. Even more subtle than that, within certain circles of Christianity, there are proliferations of just false prophets and weird charismatic ministries. And I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in gifts of prophecy and words of knowledge and wisdom. But there are some people who are crazy. And you start watching some prophecy on YouTube and that leads to another recommended video and next thing you know, you're wearing tinfoil hats and waiting for the apocalypse. And you're like, I don't got time for church because I, I got a word of prophecy. There are Christians in certain types of charismatic Pentecostal movements where they talk about revival, but they don't mean revival like Christians have historically described it. Historically, when Christians describe revival, you see a great turning from sin to God and radically following after Jesus and the calling that he has on your life. But with these weird groups, they'll, they'll say they're experiencing revival, but usually it's more like screaming and emotional manipulation and vague words of prophecy that don't get checked against reality. And groups like this, you'll notice they rarely talk about the gospel. They rarely talk about Jesus Christ or the fact that he died on the cross and rose again. And you're like, why don't you talk about Jesus more? And their attitude, although they might not come out and say it, is, well, that's just basic stuff. The, go like, the gospel is like basic. That's, that's JV. We have a deeper spiritual experience with God. We're past that. Listen, there's nothing deeper than the gospel. There's nothing deeper than the death and resurrection of Jesus. So any group who does chase after signs like this, more than the one who the signs point to, is highly suspect. More like a Christian cult sometimes than a Christian church. Not everyone who says they have a word from the Lord actually does. So it would have been wise of the Hebrew people to be skeptical if Moses showed up and said, I've got a word from the Lord. It makes sense that Moses asked God, why would they believe me? And the word of God talks about how we should have a bit of hesitancy when someone says, God told me. In Jeremiah 29, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So you gotta be careful about anyone who says, hey, God told me this, or God said to me this, or an, or an angel appeared to me. It, 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 maybe it happens, but you should be careful. There are false prophets and there are legit prophecies. Sometimes people will come up to me and they'll be like, Pastor Ryan, God told me what you need to do with the church. And I'm like, he didn't tell me, so. <laughs> if, he, if he can speak to you, he can speak to me, right? Like, and now, if he's been telling me something and then you confirm it, that's cool. But if he tells you something crazy and he hasn't told me, that's a problem. <laughs> right? So sometimes you do get a legit word or a legit prophecy. A prophecy is a message from God. And sometimes it's about what's going to happen. Or sometimes it's something that's unknown otherwise. And prophecy is a gift of the Spirit. So you don't want to write it off and act like it's just weird if you grew up in certain types of church backgrounds, maybe you haven't been exposed to much of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so 
anything you hear about prophecy or words of knowledge or healing, you're just like skeptical. You're like, oh, no, that's weird stuff. I, I, don't, I don't trust that. Don't be skeptical because God still does work through his people. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it actually says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast what is good. Sometimes people are going to give a word and they'll think it's from God, but they might be mistaken. Because humans are involved, mistakes happen. That's okay. I just told you. Spit out the bones, hold fast to what is good. Right. But test it. And in Old Testament times, when Moses went to the Hebrew people, they didn't have scriptures yet. So he had to perform signs to prove his authority. With the apostles in Acts, they had to perform signs and wonders to prove their message that Jesus had risen. Now we can test everything with the word of God. And so if someone shows up and says, thus saith the Lord, God says this, we can listen and then we can go and compare what they said to what God already said. <laughs> and if what they say doesn't line up with what God already said, we reject it. We've tested it and we found it wanting. And, and so we don't want to reject all prophecy, but we want to compare it to the authority of Scripture. Hebrews 2 says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. This great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us, right? We got to hear by those who heard him speak. And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. So we wouldn't believe a messenger automatically just because he could do signs and wonders unless what they say aligns with what we know God already said. We're going to check every miracle against the message preached by Jesus. We'll check wonders against the word of God. And if people actually did this, you would have less Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on your door and less Elder John and Elder Smith come to, come to and convert you to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know some people get mad. They're like, I don't like when you talk bad about other religions. I'm like, just wait. <laughs> just wait. And, and see, the thing is, I'm not trying to beat up or talk bad about other religions. I'm trying to warn people about false teaching that leads to hell. Pretty much every service today, someone's walked out at this part. So I'm surprised nobody has yet. Later in Exodus chapter 7, Moses is going to stand before Pharaoh with his brother Aaron, and everything we've been talking about plays out. It's like God illustrates all of this. I want to read this to you. It says in chapter 7, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. Just like the Pharisees demanded from Jesus. When he does this, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. <laughs> Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard, right? Because people won't believe sometimes, even though they see signs. He still refused to listen just as the Lord had predicted. So this is really interesting. Pharaoh's Egyptian magicians were able to replicate the sign of God, but not with power that came from God, rather with power that came from false gods, demons, or the devil. I, I don't know, but it wasn't God. And they were able to turn their staffs into serpents as well. And that's a reminder. Not every sign comes from someone sent by God. And not every miracle worker knows our creator. It's also, at the same time, it's encouragement for us today that even though the devil does have a degree of power, we don't need to fear his power because God's power is greater. Amen. Right? I, he demonstrated that here in kind of a weird way. The, the Egyptian magicians, they throw down their staffs and they turn into snakes too. And so God has his Snake eat their snakes. I guess, I, I don't know. It's like, it's like Royal Rumble of the snakes. I, I don't, I can, I can just imagine, you know, my snake can beat up your snake. I don't know. Like, but God showed his power is greater. 
And then we see with Pharaoh, not even signs and wonders will convince hard-hearted unbelievers who have chosen to not believe. I think it's cool. God gave Moses a staff as a physical symbol of God's power. It was a great reminder. Everywhere he went, he had that staff in his hand, and he was reminded God's presence was with him. God said, I will go with you. You have something greater than the staff of God. You have the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God inside you is better than the staff of God held in your hand. A staff doesn't talk to you, but the Holy Spirit will talk to you. A staff can't comfort you, but the Holy Spirit can comfort you. A staff can't teach you, but the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. A staff doesn't love you, but the Holy Spirit loves you. And the staff of Moses, it was a physical reminder. I can imagine he was standing in the throne room before Pharaoh, and he probably had some normal human anxiety about this mission. You know, he's like, let my people go. I'm sure he felt a little nervous, and he's holding that staff, and I'm guessing he was probably white-knuckling it a little bit, probably silently praying, you know, God, help me. And as he felt that smooth place in the wood where his hand rested, he was probably reminded, yeah, yeah, God, God sent me, God's with me. He's with me here. And, and you don't have a physical reminder of that probably, but you have a spiritual reminder. The Holy Spirit of God dwells inside of you. It says in Romans 8, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. So God, he doesn't owe you a display of power for every doubt. And he doesn't owe you a wonder to soothe every worry. But he has given you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit inside you will constantly and freely remind you that God is able and God is with you. The Holy Spirit will speak to your spirit like a still small voice and say, God is with you. God loves you. You're his child, and he is your father. He knows the plans he has for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. He goes before you, and he makes a way where there seems to be no way. And everywhere you go, the Spirit of God is with you, reminding you, strengthening you, comforting you, teaching you. It's the same resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead that lives in you. That means anything is possible and nothing is impossible because God's spirit is behind you and beside you and before you. If God could deliver his people from Egypt and raise his son from the grave, then God's spirit can bring you through any storm that you might be facing. And maybe you're going through one now, or maybe you will go through one. I hope not, but maybe that's God's plan is for you to go through a storm and sometimes when you're facing a difficult season, you'll pray for God to intervene, and he doesn't always do it right away. <laughs> he doesn't always do it the way you hoped he would. And you can find yourself growing impatient and maybe even doubting a little bit. Like, okay, God, when are you going to come through for me here? I could really use, you know, a miracle, a sign right now. That'd be awesome. In any day now, that'd be great. But I just want to close with going back to chapter 3 when Moses was first called by God. In the beginning of this moment, Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people, out of Israel, or the people of Israel out of Egypt? And God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Okay, confession time. When I read this and the sign that God was gonna give Moses, it's a little underwhelming. <laughs> Moses is asking like, who am I? And God says, here's your sign. After you've already done it, you're gonna worship me at this mountain. I was like, I'm kind of hoping for something in advance, you know? <laughs> but there are some signs that are only seen in hindsight. This is just the way God works, you know, like when we were building this building, we started the process here in Mesa. Uh, when we started that process, I was a little scared about the process and the, the, the endeavor itself is a big endeavor. And I knew, man, once we announced we're going to do this thing, 
we actually got to do it or I'm going to look stupid. <laughs> and I'm like, man, this thing's going to cost millions of dollars. And I'm going to ask people to give and they might not give. And then what are we going to do? And then when we started, we actually broke ground as other businesses were shutting down. And people were asking, are you still going to build that building? And I was like, I don't know. Let me ask God. <laughs> right? Like, and, and what if I asked God, God, you know, are we still supposed to build this building? God, give me a sign. This would be like if God said, yes, here's your sign. Once you've built this building, you will stand in this building and worship me in this building. God's saying, in other words, you'll know it works that I am was with you once you've done it and you're on the other side of it. You'll be able to see that all along I was with you in it. That's why 2 Corinthians says we walk by faith and not by sight. Maybe you've had doubt before and you've wondered about your salvation. You've wondered, is this really true? Is Jesus really the only way to be saved? Did he really rise from the dead? Is heaven real? Am I really going to go there when I die? And God's basically saying, yeah, a thousand years from now, you'll be worshiping me in heaven and that will be your sign. This was true. But you got to actually walk by faith, not by sight. There are some signs you'll only see in hindsight. Once you've been obedient and you stepped out in faith and that's the way God did it for Moses, that's often how God does it for us. And he won't always show you the whole path, but he'll illuminate your next step. That's why he said his word is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. And a lamp just lights usually your next couple steps at a time. And just enough to take that next step and the next step. And it's usually not till a lot of time goes by that you look in the rearview mirror and you see, oh God, he brought me such a far ways and he brought me through so much. And all along, he was with me and he was in it. And so I want to encourage you first that if you are praying for a miracle and you're hoping for God to work in your life, hold on. There is hope. God is still in the miracle working business. He still does signs. He still does wonders. His spirit still moves. So anything is possible. But ask him. Have the faith to at least ask him for help. And then if he doesn't work according to your plan and timing, trust him that he has purpose in his plan for your life. And maybe there are some of you who are here and you don't have a relationship with God. You haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You don't want to be like Pharaoh and see all the evidence and have the Holy Spirit pulling at your heart and remain hard-hearted and say, no, I refuse to believe. That would be a terrible way to remain separated from God for eternity. Refusing to open your heart to Jesus despite everything calling you to open your heart. And we don't want that for anybody. I'm going to ask everyone just to bow your heads, close your eyes for a minute. If you say, like, I want to open my heart to Jesus and believe in him, that he is the son of God and that he died for my sins so that I could be saved. Let, let's do that right now. Maybe you're here right now and this could be your moment to accept Jesus, the savior of the world. Some of you, God brought you here for a, a reason to have this encounter with the living God. And this could be your moment that changes your eternity. If that's you and you know right now, I want that. Pray this with me and just say, God, I ask you to save me. I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. And I believe he rose again so I could have eternal life. I want to follow Jesus from this day forward. I thank you, God, for leading me and for always loving me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's stand to our feet together. We're going to take a minute to respond to this message. And I want to do this first. If you need God to do some kind of mighty work in your life, if you need a miracle in your life, if you need healing or provision or restoration, raise your hand up tonight. Just say, that's me. That's me. I have faith to ask. I have faith to present my need. I need God to do a work in my life. We're going to pray for you. And, and put your hands down. Put your hands down. If you, if you just prayed that prayer to accept Jesus, Right now, raise your hand up high. Just say, that's me. I just prayed that prayer. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Say, that's me. So good. Great, man. That's awesome. Hey, church, let's lift up these knees to God and let's celebrate what he's doing. Lord, we thank you for your mighty power at work in us. We thank you for the lives that were saved and changed tonight. 
We thank you that you have healing power and providing power and restoring power. And we ask that what you've done in the past, you will do again. We love you because you first loved us and we worship you because you're good and you deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen.